Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Umbers and I'm with the Australian International Development Network. Thanks so much for joining us today. Unfortunately, Anna Demant, who was going to be facilitating today's session, is unwell, so I've stepped in on her behalf. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are tuning in from. I'm coming from Wurundjeri country. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their care of land and sea. Today is our final webinar for 2023, and we know that it's a really busy time for everybody. So we really do appreciate your presence here. It's a very important discussion. So we're really grateful that you could all join. Six years ago, almost 1 million Rohingya refugees fled their home amidst systematic persecution and violence. They took shelter over the border in Bangladesh in a refugee camp, which is now the biggest in the world. Children who were born in the aftermath of the, that attack are now school age in a place that offers little hope for the future. We are joined today by three panelists and we're really grateful for your involvement today. Fatima from Care Bangladesh, Arun from Medicine Sans Frontier and John from Children on the Edge. Thanks guys for joining us. A little bit of housekeeping, the chat function is open um, and so is the Q&A and we really encourage you all to, um, to use that. Feel free to pose any questions to the panel. We'll be getting to those um, later on in the session. Um, and we are recording the session, so it will be up on Aidan's website um, over the next coming a couple of days. So Arun, we're going to start with you and you're going to paint a bit of a picture for us, um, especially on the medical side of things. Um, but just give us a bit of a, a overview of the situation and what you've witnessed in your time of working with MSF. Thank you very much, Emily, and good afternoon to you all and to the rest of the panelists who I'm very excited to hear from as well. So the Rohingya, they're perhaps one of the most persecuted people in the world and with no real solutions on the horizon, we at MSF, we strongly feel the urgency to act and hope today we can talk a little bit about some of the practical actions we can all take and what is very clear is that it is not getting the attention that it deserves but before i begin i would like to acknowledge the and pay respects to the traditional owners of the lands from which i'm speaking from the gadigal and wongal people of the eora nation as i understand it's a contested land um, underscoring the rich civilization preceding modern day australia it shows that there was a history of people all connecting to their identity, to their land. And I think this acknowledgement is really crucial today because the roots of the Rohingya issue trace back to their homeland in Myanmar and their denial of a continued connection to it, along with the horrific consequences when people are stateless and are deprived of their rights to live freely on Indigenous lands. So to acknowledge this, this always was and always will be Aboriginal lands. As um, Emily mentioned before, I've worked, uh, I've, I've, um, been working on the Rohingya file. Um, I've worked on it for a number of years. I've completed six postings in Bangladesh. I was there before the 2017 emergency. I was there during the mass influx, and I've since returned there three times as um, MSF's head of missions there. We've got a massive program there. We've got three hospitals, clinics, a large water and sanitation intervention, uh, vaccination and outreach programs, quite large. Every time I return, it always saddens me to witness the scale of these camps. Can you imagine? One million people living in slum-like tents as far as the eye can see. And what's even worse is that their lives, living conditions and hopes are really not improving. In fact, they're getting worse. But I think it's important for us to set the stage here. So how did one million Rohingya, 400,000 of them being children, end up in Cox's Bazaar refugee camps? It didn't happen overnight. In fact, there is a lengthy history here that led to this situation. For those who don't know yet, the Rohingya, they're an ethnic minority, a Muslim Primarily Muslim people uh, comprise of around 2.2 million people. And I say minority, it's still 2.2 million is a lot of people. They called Myanmar's Rakhine, Rakhine State home until 1982, when Myanmar introduced a law revoking their citizenship. Subsequently, decades of punitive policies were imposed on the Rohingya. Structural violence happened against them, which led to at least six violent riots and pogroms causing tens of thousands to flee to Bangladesh. Six years ago, however, was the largest crisis, forcing over 850,000 Rohingya to flee, joining several hundred thousand more who were already there, and they are now living in the world's largest refugee camp. It's called Cox's Bazaar Refugee Camp, or Kutapalong Mega Camp. I vividly remember this period. 
it was clear that it was a population fleeing violence. I could see the smoke burning from the villages across the border. We treated and witnessed thousands of Rohingya men, women, and children for gunshot wounds, for burns, for smoke, smoke asphyxiation. Some of the more horrific presentations there were extreme sexual violence. And, you know, I can recount to you a number of stories where, uh, where, where parents had to choose between which children they would leave behind or take because they couldn't take them on their journey or seeing uh, one story of a man who witnessed his uh, mother and his daughter, sorry, his mother and his uh, his wife uh, had be sexually abused in front of him and then shot, and then he was released. So there's some horrific experiences, and I wish that this was an isolated story, but it's really one million stories like this. Since 1982, the Rohingya Rib, they've been stateless, um, and, and they've been enduring violence, and they've been denied proper access to education and livelihoods and freedom of movement. And this is even before coming and arriving in Bangladesh. And now whilst Bangladesh has been a very safe refuge and you know, many of the Rohingya are super grateful for being able to live uh, in, in Bangladesh, the refugee camps would soon become a bit of a new nightmare for them. Can you imagine living in, in, in those conditions surrounded by barbed wire where you you face such extreme restrictions. You're unable to work. You have 400,000 children there receiving only three years of education in their life. And they all rely on rations from aid organizations like, like MSF, like the UN and other NGOs that are present here. And these conditions were meant to be temporary. Aid organizations cannot sustain the needs of 1 million people indefinitely. It has been six years. I wouldn't say the system is failing. It's not. It was never fit for purpose. Humanitarian organizations are never meant to be an indefinite source of sustenance for a people. We're trying our best and doing our best um, with what we've got. And it's absolutely critical that we continue doing our work there because without us, there isn't uh, really a lifeline for these people. So yeah, don't get me wrong, the international community and the Bangladeshi government has done an enormous job to get to where they're at. But there are glaring problems with really devastating consequences and especially the health. For example, we are concerned quite a lot about the poor water hygiene and sanitation in the camps. The Rohingya, they're only able to access water once or twice a day, and they're well below the required volumes. Toilets, they're becoming increasingly unusable, and soap distributions are even a rare event in the camp now. So imagine NGOs servicing one million people for all their needs and humanitarian aid systems at this scale. They were never designed to last permanently. So that needs to be addressed quite Im immediately. Um, for the past six years, we've really been advocating for decongesting the refugee camps in Bangladesh and ensuring that there's proper water and sanitation facilities. The risk of large scale disease outbreaks, it's not a possibility, it's happening right now. As I speak, in the Rohingya camps, we're facing an unprecedented scabies outbreaks. Over 40% of people are affected. That's more than 400,000 people. That's the largest ever um, in the world. Scab scabies, it's a painful disease. I'm not sure if uh, many of you know it. It's where mites burrow beneath the skin and cause an intense irritation and sleepless nights. It's quite horrible. And it's just one visible example, but a very useful demonstration of how the refugee camps are really untenable because scabies is easily treatable. You just have to give a bit of drugs. Everyone cleans their sheets at the same time and voila, the problem is gone. But because people are living in tight conditions, because 400,000 people have it now because there isn't adequate water and hygiene um, facilities. It's actually quite impossible to do cleaning of a million people's houses in one shot so that it doesn't um, start up again. So you can start to see the problems that the Rohingya are facing on just one small disease, which is something very treatable in, um, in other countries. Other thing, to, other thing that we're really focused on right now is malnutrition. As I said before, uh, the people there are receiving, are dependent on food aid. They're only receiving $8 per month per person for food. That's less than 10 cents per meal. So what we're, what we're seeing now is we're starting to see babies with stunted growth, weak pregnant women, coupled with that denial of education, you can see that an entire generation of children lacks the proper nutrition for brain development as well as being
how they feel about this too. So needless to say, the conditions of the refugee camps, they're worsening month over month, year after year. And the signs are really quite evident in our facilities. The number of SGB uh, violence, sexual gender-based violence has, has doubled. The number of gunshot wounds has more than doubled. The number of ill children with malnutrition has tripled. And we've treated double the number of patients attempting suicide in 2023 when compared to 2021. We witnessed patients with increasingly complex health conditions requiring access to secondary health services, indicating that the primary health care system is strained. And that's, a re that's the first line of defense in a public health system. And we can see that now. It's, it's now moving to the next stage, now the secondary health care system. We have to refer 25% of our patients to a hospital over six hours away from the camp because there isn't closer beds or at an affordable or sustainable cost. This is all to say that unfortunately help is not on the way right now. The international community has decreased funding due to global financial pressures or has shifted focus to other contexts. These people, you know, they're forced from their homes by persecution and violence. They rely on international aid. Their lives are deteriorating day by day and now really isn't the time to decrease that funding. So, so what can we do, I think is a good, good question for us to ask ourselves. And I think in the short term, large scale multi-year health funding is urgently needed in Bangladesh and UN agencies and NGOs have a crucial part in advocating for this. This will really help with planning, predictability and urgently addressing the ongoing emergencies I mentioned. But in the long term, there needs to be durable solutions. We believe Australia can play a vital leadership role in this. I think starting with a dedicated resettlement intake for Rohingya refugees, continued advocacy and funding for humanitarian programs in Bangladesh, and, and Australia can really push for durable solutions because simply containing the Rohingya in refugee camps indefinitely is not really a strategy, especially as the conditions in Myanmar have not really been conducive for the Rohingya over the past 40 years, let alone right now, where a civil war is ensuing. I believe that there is a humanitarian imperative and an enlightened self-interested foreign policy position that governments like Australia can take. And I'll leave it there for that. Very happy to answer any questions um, in the appropriate time, but I will pass it on to my fellow panelists, Fatima. And Fatima, I'm particularly interested in hearing about the experience of women um, in the camp. It's something that uh, as a man, you don't really get access to always. Um, and really important for the people to hear and for myself to hear as well. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Um, good day. My name is Fatima. I'm working with CARE as the Program Development Coordinator based in Bangladesh. I'm very happy to be here to discuss the current sexual and reproductive health status, the urgent needs and the challenges that the Rohingya refugees face in Bangladesh. So the SRH, um, sex, the sexual and reproductive health, which I will be referring to as SRH in this session, is part of the health portfolio in this response. It's led by UNFPA and supported by over 40 partners. Um, so there's been ongoing efforts to improve the SRH status, the improve the services, the usability within the camps. Um, family planning services are considered essential as said in the minimum package of essential health services. And the government of Bangladesh has um, developed a family planning, planning strategy, which is aimed to improve SRH service provision and usability. Um, however, despite these continued efforts, there are significant challenges in ensuring accessible and efficient SRH services for the Rohingyas. So um, if we want to talk about the Rohingya women and girls, so Rohingya women and girls, they make up 52% of the Rohingya population in Bangladesh, which is huge. And this large population is continuously facing risks of maternal um, morbidity, mortality, sexual and gender-based violence, as Arun said, uninter unintended pregnancy, unsafe abortion, and unmet needs of contraceptives. And most of these women and girls, they are unaware of their fundamental human rights, and they have very limited knowledge about the SRH services and their importance. Furthermore, the misconceptions about family planning in the cultural and religious beliefs of the Rohingya pose as a challenge for the women to be involved in decision-making, especially related to family planning. We have seen that um, decisions for women when, when to have a child 
if they should have a child, how many children to have, is often made by their husbands and mothers-in-law, leaving very little space for, to, uh, for women to make their own decisions about these very vital things. Um, however, um, because of what international, national, and government organizations have been, departments have been doing, in the last quarter, between July to September, there was a 7% increase in first-time family planning visits for contraceptive methods. So more people are going to take up different contraceptive methods. And there has also been, been an 8% increase in the number of mothers who attend antenatal care on at least four occasions. However, um, maternal and perinatal mortality rates are extremely high in their camps. On average, in a month, there are seven maternal mortalities and 60 perinatal mortalities. And from January to September, there were over 2,000 recorded deaths, out of which 20% were maternal and child-related. So while international community, humanitarian organizations, and the government of Bangladesh are doing their best, there are significant needs in the community, which it is very important for us to address. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. If there are any questions, please ask. Thank you, Arun. All right there. So I think uh, we've got John next. Yeah. Great, I'll jump on in. Hi. Hello everyone, my name's John Littleton. I'm from uh, the organization Children on the, uh, on the Edge, which is based in the UK. Um, our history in Bangladesh, actually in Kutapalong camp, goes back to 2009 when we actually began our work there in Kutapalong camp. But obviously, as uh, Arun and, and Fatima have referred to, the history of the Rohingya and the persecution of the Rohingya has gone um, much deeper than that. Beginning actually the first wave was in the late 70s after Operation Dragon in Rakhine State, uh, people coming over into Bangladesh, and then again another large push in 91. Uh, 2006, 2012, which we were present for, 2016, which was the precursor to the genocide in 2017. So it's a, a, a long and tragic history of persecution for the Rohingya. And there's a long um, history in Bangladesh and neglect of the Rohingya as well. And uh, we've been witness to that over the last about 14 years. So um, when you put yourself in the position of a child in uh, Kutapalong or out in Bashanchar Island, where uh, we also have learning centers uh, where many of the Rohingya are now being re relocated to. You look at what options uh, do these children have and what opportunities are they given. Um, currently, any child in the camp of the 338,000 school age children will go into a learning center and pre currently be presented with uh, the Myanmar government curriculum uh, in Burmese, which is a language that they have no understanding of by and large, and almost certainly their teacher also has no understanding of. Um, this is an openly understood fact and yet very re reluctantly discussed in the education sector, which is very unfortunate. And so we have a whole patchwork, a network of schools that are doing their best to provide education uh, in Burmese language, a, a language that they were excluded from learning in, in, in their home country and now expected to learn in, in Bangladesh. And it creates a lot of shame and a lot of frustration amongst our two students and our teachers because the reality is that there simply isn't nearly enough teachers to uh, educate children in Burmese uh, effectively, especially beyond grade one, two, or three level. So as the longest standing education provider in Kutapalong camp, uh, Children of the Edge and our local partner, Mukti Cox's Bazaar, who's been our partner since 2009, have been seeking to address this um, because we're already seeing what the results of this policy are. Uh, children who are now you know, being born in the camp and coming into our schools, looking at their future, see very bleak or, or non-existent opportunities. You see possibilities. Uh, I mean, the only real organizations that are available to them where they see uh, organized opportunities for them are within perhaps some of the more fundamentalist uh, jihadi groups that are very active and becoming increasingly active in the camps. And then there's the criminal networks, which are becoming very, very uh, blatant and uh, yeah, very <laughs> willing to take any, any number of risks. You, one of my teachers, while I was there, I, I go to Bangladesh about once a month, and I was there last month, and one of my teachers said, it used to be we were afraid at night. Now we're afraid all the time of the gangs. Uh, we had a person shot about 
100 meters from our learning center last week. Uh, the crime, the abductions, the situation, which does occasionally make the news cycle, um, is becoming you know almost untenable. And and, and it's uh, it's really disturbing as somebody that visits on a regular basis to Bangladesh. It's disturbing to see the deterioration of the situation, especially especially for children. And then when they look forward, they they, they wonder what livelihood opportunities they have. And uh, and and the answer is they have no role models. They have very few opportunities in front of them. So we're presented with this challenge. I'm sorry to paint, paint a very bleak picture, but that's uh, that is the situation, and it's our obligation to get the word out uh, on their behalf. Um, so. In, in order to address this, uh, these challenges, Children at the Edge is, is taking um, a twofold approach. The first is uh, we're working with our some of our long-standing relationships with the uh, NGO Affairs Bureau in Dhaka, with the RRRC office in Cox's Bazaar, with the DC office in Cox's, to uh, address the issue of language. Because so much of language, I mean, so much of culture, so much of education, so much of identity comes down to language. And something has to be done about the situation for the Rohingya people who were not allowed to write their language back in, in Myanmar, in Arakan or Rakhine State, and uh, have been forbidden from using uh, the Bengali language and the Bengali written script uh, there in Bangladesh. Um, as the government has understandable concerns about um, them becoming integrated into Bangladeshi society. So... Um, Recently, we received uh, approval to run a pilot program for the Rohingya language to be written in a script written by a Rohingya professor living in Bangladesh called uh, the Hanifi script. Uh, it's going to allow us to actually teach the children to read and write their own language and their own thoughts and ideas for the very first time, and also to translate the uh, Myanmar government textbooks into a language that they can begin to comprehend. Uh, and so the process of learning that language takes anywhere from one to three months for a child. And then we hope to begin in earnest after that, uh, the, the translation and the instruction of the Myanmar government curriculum textbooks and hope to receive uh, approval beyond the pilot uh, starting in next July with the new school year. Um, in the meantime, we don't, you know, we feel compelled to provide education. Um, and so the only other opportunity or avenue available to us is audiovisual learning. In our, for about our 8,000 students have uh, battery power projectors and digital lessons. And we have created learning videos for the grades one to three Myanmar government curriculum textbooks where the teacher is, uh, well, the virtual teacher is projected in, on the classroom wall and literally goes through the textbook page by page and explains to the teacher and the student simultaneously so that the teacher can then uh, fully understand what's in the book and then from the experience provide instruction. And so that is the that is the stopgap that we've been using since 2019. Uh, we we created about 400 lessons under the old LCFA, which was the English Burmese hybrid textbooks, and now we're doing it for the Myanmar government curriculum, which is the mandated curriculum in in, in the camps. Um, another outgrowth of that has been when the students, when our students in Kudapalong, and also we have students in Cox's district and up in Dohazari and, and Shakania up near Chittagong and also on Bashanchar Island, when they saw their teachers um, there in their, in their classrooms on their screens, they were very excited. And they came to us and they said, well, why can't we make our own videos? And so we didn't have a good answer to that. So the answer was yes, of course. So we've also established in parallel to that a digital platform called Moja Kids, which is a uh, weekly, uh, almost weekly uh, video newsletter and it's created by the children in Kudapalong Camp, you know, on Bashanchar Island, in Cox's uh, district schools, and also up in Dohazari Shakania schools. And they are able to swap video, uh, create videos, and then have these videos uh, circulated throughout our network of about 8,000 students amongst our networks of schools. And we found this has really been invaluable, especially for children on the island and in the camp who have no idea of what is outside that barbed wire. Or, or, or the showers that can find them. They have no understanding of the world. The internet is heavily throttled. Um, they don't have access to wider media. And so they're getting a very myopic view of the world. And so by providing these newsletters, we give them a small window into what the world is outside. And even doing things as simple as translating nature documentaries or how it's made episodes or little things that we would just assume that these children, oh, they understand uh, how a bike tire is made. No, they don't. They've never been given that opportunity. They've never been given proper education. And so um, these videos are actually really powerful tools for expanding their understanding of the world and for showing them that they do have rights and opportunities that they're not laying claim to. So that's, uh, I'll, I'll put that in the chat. That's called uh, mojakids.net. We have about, we've just hit our 80th video. We're very proud of it. 
And we're continuing to uh, move forward with the digital education initiative. And we're also moving forward with the uh, Rohingya language pilot as well. And we hope to report back middle of next year, beginning of next school year in July on that. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, it's a really uh, bleak and really horrendous um, picture that you, the three of you have all painted. And John, it's really fascinating to hear about that, um, the innovation and the programs that you guys are doing, you know, around language and how you can kind of bridge that gap um, for particularly for the children that are um, that you're working with and I'd love to get more into that um, soon we did have a question came through for you Fatima um, so we'll jump back to you and um, just to note that everyone's going to help me facilitate some of the questions and I'm sure you guys have got questions for each other as well um, but um, Fatima what going back to the um, SRH um, programs what are the ne what needs to be done to improve the situation um, do you think and in, in your line of work Thank you, Emily. Um, so to improve SRHR, we would need to heavily engage the community in the SRH programming. Um, uh, during several evaluations, when talking to the participants, it came out that they'd want, they want to be a part of the design of the programming so they can share what their needs are. And especially because with the, uh, with the cultural barriers and the limited decision-making space for women, this becomes very difficult when we want to engage women and girls. But apart from engaging women and girls, it's very important that we involve men as well, men and boys, so that they're, they support these women and girls to get an enabling environment. Um, even though the SRH component was rolled out after the 2017 influx, there's been little in the way of involving male participants. And another um, area that we need to improve is abortion services. We know that the abortion services within the camps are extremely limited. And if a DNC is required, which is an emergency, patients will need to be taken to hospitals outside of the camps, which is often a very complex and time consuming um, process. Um, Apart from that, ultrasound services, which is extremely important to diagnose um, pregnancies in the early stage, these are also limited. So there's a lot to be done in, in terms of really improving the services. While there are pr primary healthcare centers and health posts all over the camps, there are service gaps, as was identified through the rational rationalization exercise of the health sector. Mm, thank you, Emily. Thanks, Fatima. That's very, very interesting. So we've got a number of questions that have come through. I'll, I'll try and go through and direct them to the right, right people here. Um, I think it would be good to go to John for the next one, actually. John, I, I think it's incredible work that Coates doing. You know, you've really laid out a very restrictive context in which the education sector is providing education care. You've, you know, doubly, doubly difficult to hear about what the children are going through. Um, but you're finding creative ways to weave through it and, uh, you know, including those videos and, and, and different ways of uh, engaging with people. I, I want to ask you a very difficult question, and if you, if you have the time for this one, but what does it do to a population at scale? Are there any singularities that you can see happening to the children there when they're denied such education, such hope, such, uh, you know, for thinking about their their, uh, their their future. Have you seen anything on a, on a real population level scale that's happening there? Um, and I guess the last question is from uh, from from Cynthia, which is: Do educational opportunities embrace legal legal rights such as asylum rights? So those two questions, to you. Okay, I'll take the first one first, and then I'll have to circle back to the second one to be sure I do it justice. Um, I mean, I'm a relatively young man. I'm in my mid 40s, so I I can't speak with the same perspective as some people that have worked on these issues for uh, decades more than I. Um, but one thing that always haunts me a little bit is that we had a journalist from the Times of London come and visit. And I think this is around 2018, maybe early 2019, when you're already beginning to see the signs of kind of atrophy in the camps. You know, we had transitioned from the emergency stage, and then it was becoming a you know abundantly clear that these people were not going anywhere, that return wasn't happening, but also that, you know, a more sustainable solution, as you refer to, wasn't also taking place. And so essentially what you had is a, 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 a giant a giant open air prison, which I guess is a term we've heard in the media again and again recently, 
for other very tragic reasons. Um, but that is the reality of what the situation is there and also on the island, on Bashantar Island. And um, <clears throat> this particular journalist, I won't name him, but he'd, he's been working in journalism for about three decades at that time. And he said, the only other time I've seen something on this scale was on the Afghan-Pakistan border um, during that time, when you have a large population of people pushed out from their home and the host country rejects them and pushes them back to the border. And then they're just penned in into that area and left with not enough services or opportunities. And then he said, well, you, and, and we, the world has seen, the world has reaped the consequences of what we did on the Afghan-Pakistan border um, 40 years ago. Um, and we're still paying the consequences for that, you know. Um, so it, it does concern me. I, and, and we're beginning to, I mean, it's not subtle. We're beginning to see signs of deterioration in society. And uh, that's why we're pressing ahead with all urgency on issues of education and identity, um, but also the need for basic, you know, health and water and sanitation and, and reproductive services. There's, there's, you know, the system is failing uh, at almost every level. All, all the alarm lights <laughs> are flashing bright red right now. And so... Um, it really is a moment uh, where there's so many needs in the world, and, and, we, and we understand that, but uh, this is the world's largest concentration of stateless people. It's the world's largest refugee camp, and uh, the consequences for the future are, are, are very dire and very real. So can you remind me of the second question real quick? Sorry. Yeah, very much so, John. But just first of all, just to touch on a few points, they're really, really important that you mentioned. You're basically describing a protracted emergency here, aren't you, John? And like, the urgency of this cannot be underscored. So thank you, thank you for sharing what you've just shared there. The last question, one of the questions from Cynthia was actually, do educational opportunities embrace legal rights such as asylum rights? So do the frameworks of asylum seekers and refugees, do they apply here uh, to the educational opportunities? Well, that is that, that's more of a tightrope question than the than the first question. Um, and I have to be very careful how I comment because uh, obviously the government of Bangladesh is a signatory to several conventions and uh, and, and treaties. Um, it should it should apply. It doesn't necessarily apply across the board. And even uh, we do try to address issues of rights. Uh, you know, we we take a child rights approach uh, to our programming, um, but we also have to be very um, sensitive to, 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 the, to the realities. I mean, the reality is uh, the language spoken in Chittagong and on down, uh, Chittagong dialect and, and the Ring language are, are sister languages. They're very similar. And so if the Rohingya people um, would, would, would be, you know, were to be educated in, in, in Bengali, the national language, uh, they would be indistinguishable from the population of Southern Bangladesh very quickly, you know, in terms of um, culture, language, uh, background, uh, very similar. So I, we, we fully understand that the Bangladesh government has concerns about that. And, and we are trying to fortify the efforts to give Rohingya their own language and their own identity. Um, but that said, there are some restrictions that come when you can't, uh, you know, use certain education materials and education resources and languages uh, to provide education. And so um, I'm sorry, Cynthia, for not answering your question directly, uh, but it is a very sensitive uh, topic and one that we are uh, aware of and, and, and doing our best to accommodate as, as we can. And uh, just lastly, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it is a very bleak picture, but I've put the, the Moja Kids uh, website there in the chat. Um, not all is dark. There is still light. And uh, we've we've created our first green room in the camp. And the children of Kudapalan camp are making their own uh, videos in exotic locations, depending on where they're in the green room. They're doing skits. They're uh, they're doing dances. So um, to provide a little bit of, of levity uh, or light, please do uh, check out some of the videos uh, created by the kids in the camp there. Um, because obviously, there's huge potential and huge creativity within that camp, too. So I'll leave it at that. Excellent, John. And, and I really want to speak to that creativity as well. Like uh, we did this recently, we did a bit of an art project in the camp around mental health and with kids. And you can just see the, that, you know, they, they, they created this new form of artwork called bamboo, bamboo uh, cane, cane glass. And I'll put it in the chat here, but just the awesome contribution to society that these people have just needs to be put to the front and, and facilitated so that, you know, we can, um, move away from this kind of de deficit mindset of the camp as well. So the work you're doing, John, is, is incredible. Um, yeah. So Fatima, we've got a question for you from Peter. Peter's interested in what initiatives have been taken with the Myanmar government in regards to the re resettlement of Rohingya, uh, potentially coming back to the Rakhine state. 
Thank you, Arun. So we know that over the last couple of years, there's been conversation ongoing with the Myanmar government about repatriation. And there's been delegates from Myanmar who has visited the camps in Bangladesh. They have interviewed Rohingya, asking them what they feel about going back. And that delegate and delegates from Bangladesh have also visited Myanmar. Rohingyas have also visited Myanmar, a small group, to understand if the environment has improved and if, and if it is conducive for them to return. Um, so there, while there has been dialogue and visits to both of these countries, however, um, so far it still lo looks quite bleak because um, it's um, the Rohingya are very eager to go back. That's without a doubt. They do want to go back to their home. However, the problem is the the the, the challenge that they see is that it's not safe for them that you know they've been persecuted on for like over 60 years now and if it is really safe for them to go back so repatriation is one of our one of the top priorities in this response for the rohingya to go back to myanmar which is why the myanmar curriculum has come in which is why um, contextual skill development is also happening within the camps however right now whatever has been done um, it does not really seem like repatriation would be possible in the near future, not unless the situation in Myanmar were to improve drastically. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Fatima. That um that paints a really interesting dilemma here, right? Where in the in the politics of it all, it's either repatriation or nothing. And I think what NGOs and the UN and um, you know all of us on here are trying to really break that, break that and be like, well, right now, how can we improve the lives of people as they stand in Bangladesh um, so that they can get education or they can get sexual reproductive health care? So that's really, that's really important that you mentioned that, Fatima. Thank you. I've actually got a question back to you, Fatima, as well. Just a bit of a comment because one of the things I remember in over the last six years has been how our programming has actually changed a lot as well because, you know, in the emergency phase, we were seeing a lot of the health seeking behaviors of the Rohingya was very different, wasn't it? They were they were not used to healthcare. They were not used to institutionalized healthcare. And then all of a sudden we've got these big hospitals and clinics run by fancy NGOs and cars and you know, and that's that was quite an intimidating thing for the people there. So, you know, when it comes to your health education, your health promotion, how has that evolved as well as you know, you seeing also people an uptick in, uh, in, in taking up the services as well. So if you have any commentary about that, uh, uh, Fatima, I would love to hear from you. And then from Fatima, if, if John, if you also had some experience as well with your programming, that would be great. Thank you, Arun. So yes, there has been a change in the health seeking behavior among the Rohingya. In 2017, it was very difficult to get the women out of the houses, but now more women are leaving the houses not adolescent girls though, that, that is still a significant challenge. Girls beyond the age of 12 are often not allowed to leave their houses, which impacts um, their development in multiple areas. So um, the health seeking behavior has improved among the women because of a lot of behavior change programming that is ongoing. However, um, in one of CARE's evaluations, so CARE was implementing a project with funding through DFAT, uh, through the Australian High, uh, High Humanitarian Partnership, sorry. So in through that project, we had an evaluation where we spoke to women and girls about what they feel about the facilities, the health services that are being provided and how they think it could be improved. And um, I'm sorry that I cannot speak for men and boys for in this particular instance, but a lot of the women and girls, they preferred going to the women and girls safe spaces for health services for family planning methods. Um, so there, the, the challenge, the problem that they shared is that when they go to a health clinic, a clinic to get family planning methods or whatever medication, their family members know what they're going. They, ha they have an idea, you know, that probably they're going there for family planning methods or contraceptives. And they often feel that this breaches their privacy and this increases the complicate complications in their life so women and girls they do prefer going to a space where it's just them and they have privacy and they can speak their heart out 
Um, and so, yes, there has been improve improvements, definitely, but there's still a lot to be done, especially given that, you know, mental health is so important for this population, given what they've been through. And I guess more should be done for mental health. And the same was shared by the community that they feel that a more comprehensive mental health support would support them do better in their lives. I hope I hope that answers your question, Arun. Thank you. Very much so, um, Fatima. Thank you. And John, did you have any comments on in terms of your programming as well? Um, in, I have a couple of comments. One going back actually to the repatriation question. I would just quickly say um, because I have been uh, regularly uh, visiting the camp for over a decade now, running focus groups um, quarterly throughout the year. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, especially since 2017, is that the level of understanding of rights has increased dramatically amongst the Rohingya population there. And there is a strong sense, uh, as as Fatima noted, that they would like to go home, but there's also equally a strong sense that they've, they have demands in terms of uh, um, accountability and uh, reconciliation and compensation and 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 you know, quite frankly, things that don't appear eminent. And so um, it's really incumbent on us in the in the NGO community and the diplomatic community to um, to, to voice th those demands. And and I don't really see any sort of immediate movement in, in, until, um, you know, th those issues are addressed. And sometimes there's a reluctance to talk about them because the reality is the situation in Myanmar is, to, is not improving and uh, and abuses continue to happen, uh, both in Rakhine and Kachin and uh, Kareni areas. I mean, all, we work on on three borders, and all three borders we've had uh, abuses committed, you know, within the past weeks. And so it's it, it's not a situation that is in any way, though it may not be making the news cycle, it's not improving. Um, in terms of education, they, they, one of the notable differences we've seen over the last couple of years, though, is that um, we work uh, with a lot of Rohingya populations outside the camp in Cox's Bazaar slums and up in uh, Dohazari area, which is just south of uh, Chittagong, which are fully Rohingya communities. And we've actually seen a return to the camp from those communities there because, uh, you know, the situation outside the camps for Bangladeshi, for the host communities, is also extremely challenging, which is why we do put a full 25 percent of our program funding into the host communities. Um, not immediately around the camp, but a little further afield. Um, but it also speaks to how desperate the situation is. And I do want to be sure to note that uh, for many of the people in the host community uh, areas, um, and, and also for many of the Rohingya who came over in 2006, 2012, 2016, left the camp seeking better opportunities, um, they're actually coming back to the camps now. Um, you know, because eight dollars a month on food is, is is still a better offer than what they're getting outside of the camps, and that just speaks to the the wider challenges um, that we see in Bangladesh. John, that's a that's a really good, really good. Uh, even it's even a political position, really, isn't it, to show like how Bangladesh has really welcomed you know this a million people into the country, and and you know even from a health perspective, the beds in the district hospital were already full. They were already at capacity before the a million people kind of came up. So really, it's really been on this international response to to pick up the the slack and and contribute to it. But it's not sustainable as we've all been talking about right now. So something's got to give here. Uh, we're still figuring out what that is. We do believe that uh, governments do have a role to to play in that solution because otherwise, yes, you will get movements of people in and out and around. And and I think that's something that. You know, we we don't want to see in the in the in the longer run. So, with that in mind, I thought it would be good to also, uh, from our perspective, from MSF's perspective, you touched a little bit on this, Fatima, about mental health, um, and and some of the challenges that our psychologists are seeing, our psychiatrists are even seeing, are quite complicated pathologies where the sense of hope is what allows some people beyond the medicated part, beyond the therapeutic part, it allows people to move through uh, a mental health crisis. But because of what you've shared, John, and because of what you've shared, Fatima, that sense of hopelessness actually doesn't allow people to move through it. So we're seeing pathologies here that are really reminiscent of people in, uh, you know, in even Australia's experience of in Nauru, where people were stuck in indefinite detention. And, and that is somehow sometimes even more traumatizing than their initial traumatic event that they experienced as well. So we just wanted to share that uh, little development here. And, you know, I put you on the spot there, John, about what we're saying about an entire population. That's one 
takeaway we're seeing from this entire population that their mental health status is just dropping down and um, that really contributes to the survival of a people and the resilience of a people uh, which I have to say is some of the, the highest number of resiliences I've seen in a community uh, going through what they're going through every day. Um, so with that in mind, uh, is there any other questions? John, Fatima, do you have any questions for anyone else on the panel here? I, I'm so I just to quickly to touch on the last uh, point to give a little broader context. It's a million people in the refugee camps, and then there's up to approximately estimated almost half a million Rohingya outside the camps as well. So Bangladesh, as the world's eighth most densely populated country, um, and outside of city states, pretty much one of the most densely populated in the world, it really is carrying a, a, a huge burden. And I, I I can't overstate that. This is I don't want any of the comments I made to be portrayed as a criticism of the government of Bangladesh. They are facing uh, challenges of their own for certain. And uh, and this is just a, a unnecessarily heavy burden. Un, you know, we can't expect them to carry that. Um, but at the same time, as Arun pointed out, this is not a situation that's tenable for NGOs to continue indefinitely either. So uh, I do feel like if there's a conclusion, we're reaching a point where um, an inflection point where something needs to be done, um, uh, you know, on, on various levels to, to address this, because this, the current situation isn't sustainable. And, um, and, and where it's leading, we can begin to see uh, there's some really concerning outcomes uh, ahead. So I guess that's a bit of a bleak uh, <laughs> final thought, but uh, it, it, I think that's kind of the common thread through what you guys have shared and what you know my, my experience has been uh, in working in this community. Um, but that said, there's like you pointed out, Arun, tremendous resilience, tremendous creativity. Um, you know, we've creative op creative opportunities we've given the children have just been seized upon. I mean, they're just so excited for any opportunity to express. Uh, so eager for any, any understanding of the wider world um, and so ready to engage, you know, uh, and there, you know, there are concerns that if we if we don't meet those needs, then we will begin to see some of the pathologies and, and some of the the, the concerns that you're, you're talking about. But at the moment, the, the students I can speak for our students, they're very eager to engage and, and very ready to uh, engage with the outside world. Mm. Thank you. Um, thanks, John. And we are going to share some of those videos and the clips from that program in the wrap up. And just maybe one final thought just from each of you before we wrap up. But, um, you know, you, John, you just talked about the various levels of work that's being done. But from a, uh, you know, from advocates watching on here in Australia, what is some practical support that um, you know, the philanthropy community could take um, here in Australia and, you know, in regards to funding advocacy, um, what are some of those practical um, things that people can do? I'd love just to hear from all of you before we wrap up. Maybe um, Arun, if you want to jump in. I almost want to say a bit of a mixture of what John was talking about, any initiatives that can bring out the creativity the skills, the sense of awe when you see people, I think would be incredible. Any programming that contributes to that is real, practical, daily, will impact the lives of you know 400,000 kids um, very quickly. So that's really important that we focus on the soft programming. But then I think at the same time, we have a platform. You know, We're living outside in, 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 in other countries where we can also engage with our governments. We can keep this issue top on for of powerful networks, especially friends who are influential or, um, or uh, other colleagues who are influential and really lobby um, the governments that that, are, that have a stake in this to find some durable solutions there. I think the issue with the Rohingya is that they're becoming a forgotten people and that that's the responsibility that's on us. So uh, on top of what I've said before, that's I think something that we should all take away from this. Tell 10 of your friends today about, uh, about the webinar, about the Rohingya. Let them watch it and let that kind of spark as well. So that's what I would mm. say. For myself. Thanks, everyone. Um, Fatima, over to you. Thank you, Emily. Just to chime in with what Arun was saying that, you know, this is a large population of people who has had extremely difficult life for generations and they've come here. And just to think that, you know, sexual rights is something that is so far off for them that when, what kind of contraceptives to use, what kind of, when 
if and when to engage in sexual relations, these kind of very um, basic needs and rights, these people are not getting. So any kind of support would definitely help this response really build on this SRH component, really, um, because the part that we really need to do is find some hope within these people from among these people. And the best way to do that is to help their development, their mental development, their social, their physical and emotional development, which sexual and reproductive health can do. So, and give, um, resilience is a big, big word these days in the Rohingya response. And um, while there are two sides to resilience, but eventually we need to ensure that this population is resilient so that they can take care of themselves and um, education and certain skills, unfortunately cannot help with that. There's a lot of um, community engagement, a lot of community participation that is required to really support these people so that they can find the hope. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Fatima. Um, John, over to you. And we talked about you, um, Fatima, you just touched on that feeling of hope as well. And we do, and John, you mentioned that before. And I think that's a really good way to end this session as well. But um, yeah, just John, your final thoughts on just some of those practical measures. Um, and, you know, you've, you've given us some hope as well, talking about the programs that you're doing around language and creativity um, and using technology in various ways that you can, but just a final thought from you before we wrap up. Yeah, I, I, I think the other panelists have, have covered it pretty well. Um, Arun summed it up, um, you know, that the actions needed, um, you know, both for soft program and also to continue to ensure that their needs are met. So I appreciated that summary and uh, I couldn't say it better or in a better accent than he said it. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think I would just defer to that. Um, but yeah, just, just to continue to advocate for the rights of the Rohingya so that they are not forgotten. You know, they, they, oh. they were completely forgotten people. Then they were the boat people for a few years in the 2010s. No one really knew them by name. And then it was this tragic genocide that actually brought their name to the, to the surface. And, um, and now they're fading back kind of into the background. And so we just need to keep that uh, their name in our conversations and uh, sharing them with people um, and advocating for their rights and giving them those opportunities to be heard um, and, and, and seen. And so that's, I think that's what all these organizations are trying to do is, um, is, is keep the spotlight deservedly on them. So thank you to my uh, fellow panelists and to the people that came today to hear. I really do appreciate all your efforts. Yeah, thank you. Um, on behalf of Aidan, I'd like to thank um, the three of you for sharing your insights and and what you're doing. I think the challenge has been set. So for everybody that's tuned in today, um, we want you all to share this webinar with um, at least five friends that would be, or five people in your network. I think that would be a really practical measure that we can all take before the end of this year. Um, so yeah, on behalf of everybody, uh, sorry, everyone at Aiden, thanks for tuning in if you did. Um, and yeah, a really huge thanks to our panelists as well. We'll be sending out the recording of this so that you can share it. Um, and it will be on Aiden's website as well. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you're tuning in from, and, um, we'll hope to see you all in the new year for some more really important discussions. Thank you.